All right, good morning, everyone. Um, Rich is giving me a warning right off the bat, saying my audio is broken up. I did notice some issues um, where the stream says it's not receiving the data all of a sudden. sudden. So hopefully, hopefully you guys can uh, hear me okay and see me okay. Um, if not, I'm not sure what I can do about it because, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's more of an internet or streaming problem, not one that I can actually correct or, or do something different. So let's uh, let me rush this this window, this window to make sure I can see your your chat and just uh, give me a sound check. Make sure you guys can hear me okay. Uh, hey Steve, hey uh, Sam, hey Val Valerie, Valeria. Um, good morning, Thomas. Welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, it was choppy. Hmm. 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 Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me just check. Let's see if there's something I can do. I don't know what I could do, but let me just make sure my internet is streaming at the right speed and it is i'm getting a bit a bit or down let's see, let's see getting uh very choppy oh that's, that's not good all right what i can do is I, I'll, I'll attempt to stop it and then start again hopefully i won't lose you guys so uh, hang, on, hang on for one second all right, let me let me start. Here we go. Be right back. All right, I should be back. Let me know if I am and you can hear me, hear me okay. I'm not seeing the warning anymore, anymore, so hopefully I'll take care of it. All right, all right, give me a heads up. Sure you can see everything okay. I'm back. I should, should be back. I see myself self being back. <laughs> Let me see if it's uh, still, still crackly. Hmm. Echo. There's not, not much. Oh, that turns it off completely. We don't want that. Re Reverb. All right, let's clear the. How about now? Uh, so hopefully the audio is not sad that you nope, nope, still bad. Okay. I don't, I don't know what I can do about that. Dun, dun. Picture's good, it's good though. So nothing wrong with the, the picture, just audio, huh? Seems to be the same. A little bit max, max headroom. Okay, let me try, try something else. Uh, I don't know what that, what that something else is going to be though. Hold on, hold on. Go on my audio, audio meter. Ah, hang on. I see, see one thing that should be, be corrected. Hold on real quick, quick. Let's do one, one thing. All right, how about now? Let me know what that sounds like. Sounds like. There, sh there shouldn't be another recording device devices in them, Philip. But th thanks. Uh, let me let me let me know what that sounds like. No sound sounds like bad. Weird connect connect. I don't start unplugging things. Nope, still echoing. Hmm. My check one two two. Okay. How about now? Same, same, same. How about now? Test, test, test. Test audio. Victoria telling, telling me. Still echoing. I can't imagine, imagine what the echoing is. All right. Let me let me try this. All right. 
still echoing. You know when we're all together. We check one, two, two, three, four. Maybe, uh, yeah, restart is going to def definitely take a lot longer than than, <laughs> than anything else I could do. Like be at least a few minutes. Same issue, chop, chopping with punches, stat, stat, wow. All right, guys, uh, let, me, let, me, let me pop a screen screen real quick. I'm going to come back, back and um, I'll just plug in a different different mic. Hang on. Be right. Mic check one, two, three, four. Mic check one, two, three, four. All right, let me know what that sounds like. That's a totally different mic. The other mic's turned off. So give me a heads up. The mic seems good now. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, perfect now. All right, let's move on. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. This is what happens when you're live. If it was a recorded video, you edit it, you fix it, you move on. No one ever knows it happened. But when it's live, it's live. So you got to see the live problem. That's the mic I use every single week. Never touched it, never changed it. Not sure what's going on. Okay, but anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, sorry for the, the eight-minute problems of audio, but hey... It's a Friday. It's a still a Friday. You'll still get the weekend. All right. So with that said, my name is Terry White, worldwide designer, photography evangelist here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again on my Friday masterclass. Today, we're going to be doing part two of a topic that was really popular two weeks ago. And that is um, how do I do that in Lightroom? We're going to do part two. Now, I see a bunch of people already... Um, already in the various chats and thank you for joining me in the various chats uh hopefully that you were able to stick around with the audio issue and we got it resolved but with that said uh if you want to participate in the chat uh that i'm going to actually be looking at which is the uh, behance chat be sure to head over to b.net slash adobe live that's the one chat window uh, that i can pay attention to because i can't look at all of them and still present as well so head over to that chat window um, you can log in with your Adobe ID. Adobe IDs are free. You can use even your social media to log in, whatever you prefer. And uh, that's the chat I'll be looking at. All right. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and jump into what we were doing. So for those of you who are like, what is he talking about? How do I do that in Lightroom? Um, Lightroom. So this was actually based on a book from my buddy, Scott Kelby. We gave away this book uh, two weeks ago. We probably will give it away again today. And um, this is where I got the idea from. And I was like, you know what? That'd make a good um, masterclass topic. And I asked Scott, hey, would that be okay if I steal the title of your book and turned it into a masterclass? And he said, sure. I'm not using this content. I'm just using that title. I'm using my own content, my own images, so forth and so on. But I like the idea. So we did, two weeks ago, we did How Do I Do That in Lightroom. Last week, I did same thing. He has another book called How Do I Do That in Photoshop. The Lightroom went very well, got lots of feedback after the fact, and so I decided to do it again as a, um, as a part two. I didn't get through everything the first day anyway. So that's what we're working on. All right, so the first one, I have a list of just items that are in no particular order. Uh, this one is actually one that I need to do, so I saved it as a tip. As you know, in Lightroom, you can create as many collections as you want, and I love collections. I probably have at least 100 collections in this catalog. Uh, which is my main catalog. And I've got a collection right here called How Do I Do That in Lightroom? Um, and that image, that one has 35 images in it right now. You'll notice the one above it though, Apple Pro Raw, the, the difference is this one has a plus sign after it. 
And whenever you, there, there will only always be one collection that has a plus sign after it. And whenever you see that one plus sign after a collection, that means that that is your target collection. So the question is, what's a target collection and how do I set a collection as a target collection if you choose to? And um, before I forget, let me just, I just had a random thought here. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm typing on the wrong keyboard. Hang on. Just had a random thought of something I need to do, which is, uh, I did it last time too. I just wanted to give you guys, in case you don't win the book today, and since Scott was so gracious in letting me uh, use, his, use his title, uh, I should share with you guys the link to the book. So here's the book. Hopefully that's still on my clipboard. Let's see. No, it's not. Let's undo. Let's grab it real quick and copy the link there it is all right let's try it now there it is great so i posted that in the chat for those that are um interested in the book here i can quickly post it in the other chats too you can go grab that book uh, as an ebook or a physical book and when when i give it away today and when i gave it away two weeks ago I gave it away as a physical book, so uh, they will ship the book to you if you win it. All right. Okay, now back to where we were. Um, so target collections, what are they and why would you want to set one as a target collection? Imagine that you're going to do a book or you're going to do a presentation or you're going to do a slideshow or you're going to export images out for whatever reason. And they're all over the place. Like you've got some in your travel collection. You've got some in your portraits collection. Maybe you're trying to create a portfolio. Well, as you're going around getting those images and assembling them in that one collection, it's a very manual process, meaning you create the collection, then you have to go to where an image is and another collection or folder and drag it into that collection you just created. Then you got to go to the next folder or collection and drag those in. Well, if you set one as your target collection, then you can just hit a keyboard shortcut no matter where you are and the image will be uh, copied over to that collection. Not moved, but copied. So how do I set it? If I go to where the collection is, right click. There is set as target collection. Once I do that, that will put, you can't see the plus sign because the, the column's too small, but it will put that plus sign right after that collection. Now, the reason I wanted to do this is because one of the things I'm going to be showing you in a few minutes is something about panoramas. And I need to put some panoramas in that collection. So I go down to my pano collection, which has some images in it that I use to make panos. And um, I can go ahead and grab those images. Let's go ahead and let's see, let's see, 16, 508. Here we go, I just wanna grab the right ones, not the one that's already done. And so I selected four images. And to move those, not move, but copy those into that target collection, I just hit the letter B, as in Bravo, on my keyboard. And it will quickly say, add to target collection, and it just did. So now if I go back to that collection, how do I do this in, uh, how do I do that in Lightroom? There they are. So, and they're still in the other collection, they're still in the folder, they're still everywhere else they were, but now it quickly added them to the target collection. So, once you're done with this being the target collection, you can go set any other collection as the target collection, and that way you can quickly get, um, you can quickly get images into your target collection. All right, so with that said, uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to um, go to the next thing. Let me go back to my list. All right, next in my list, creating a panorama. I <laughs> should have known that would be the next thing. All right, so I have uh, images here that I shot purposely to create a panorama. They're kind of in a backwards order or not really in the right order. Uh, 509, 510, oh, they're in the right order. 508, 509, 510, 511. Um, so that's basically just going click, turning, and giving yourself at least 20% overlap. Click, click, click as many times as you need to capture the scene. And that means that you probably either didn't have a wide angle lens or you didn't, you couldn't get far enough back to get it all in one shot. So that's what we do for, that's why we create panoramas. So we select our individual images. And when you create a panorama in Lightroom, it actually creates it, um, 
it actually uh, creates a new image from it. It creates a new raw file. So I'm going to go ahead and right click. And if I do photo merge, there is panorama. It's also the keyboard shortcut control M. So if I do panorama, that will, um, no, I don't want to do that instead. That'll bring up the four images into a preview and show me what that panorama is going to look like, even though the color is off in the preview. Don't worry about that. Now you also have different modes for um, your um, your projection. So if it needs, it, and you can, you can click on these to see which one you like best, but you can uh, quickly and easily do that. Now you notice I also have something called auto crop on. That's what I would have used in the past, but when I turn that off, you'll see this is what I would really get. That's why we do an auto crop especially if you handheld the images, like you went click, 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 click. Chances are you moved up or down a fraction of a whatever inch or whatever, and you, you, you end up with a lot of this extra white space that is unusable. Well, I don't think we necessarily have to do anymore because even though this is a non-destructive application, some of the things that Lightroom is starting, or Lightroom team is starting to put in are features from Photoshop that would normally be destructive, but since you're creating a new file anyway, you're not messing with your originals, therefore it can be destructive. It can be something you would normally not get. So you could do empty space, so you still get the full size of your panel, or you can use some content-aware fill technology and just click, and it will try to fill in that space using the other parts of the image. So you can try all three. You can try which one and see which one you like best because it's going to create a new one says, am I getting buffering? Oh, no, not buffering. Uh, da, da, da. This is just not a good day for streaming. All right, I'm going to keep going just so we can keep the hopefully the replay good. Let me look over here. Yeah, this is. Let's try it again. All right, hopefully I'm back now without the buffering. I don't know, today's just not a good streaming day for me. I don't know what it is about YouTube or what's going on with the connection behind the, end, behind the scenes. Anyway, um, uh, hopefully that solved it. I don't see the connection error anymore, so hopefully that fixed it. All right, refreshed and it cleared up. You can always try refresh, see what happens. All right, anyway, we have you have the, if you missed what I said, it was basically you, you have your choice of auto crop, your choice of fill edges, or your choice of give you the full size of your frame. So now that I've done that, I've got my, um, I've got it building in the upper left-hand corner. So it's building a brand new image and it will put it next to or intermingle it into the uh, images that you use to make the panorama. By the way, bonus tip, whenever you see, uh, keep working while that's happening. So here's our new panorama. That was the one using the fill edges. I can't tell what it did, so it looks pretty good to me. And that's again, borrowing some of that content aware fill technology to create a new image, um, which doesn't matter if it's destructive because it created a new image, it didn't mess with my originals. Uh, in Lightroom. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next thing. Uh, so that is set the target collection. Oh, so next along those same lines, we're going to do an HDR. So what's an HDR? So um, you've seen here, let me go to my HDR collection. I've got a perfect example. Here we go. You've seen situations where you have a, a, a challenging lighting situation. So, for example, you have, um, let me get rid of this one. You have, uh, you have a scene like this where if you're trying to get ex exposed both the inside of the cave and the outside of the cave, your eye does that naturally. So, you can see it with your eye and... Your camera, for whatever, doesn't see it because your camera's sensor is still not as good as the human eye. So if I were to expose for the inside of the cave, I'm going to get that. If I expose for the outside of the cave, I'm going to get that. And what HDR does is it combines the two images together so that you end up with a, a, um, a scene that is, uh, that is what you wanted. So let me undo my delete. There it is. And so here's the HDR 
uh, scene that I created from those two images. So I can see the inside of the cave, I can see the outside of the cave, did a little uh, white balance so it gets the right tone, and that's the way it looks. All right, um, let's move on now. And let's go back to my other collection. And in my other collection, I have these images I've shown before. I've taken these in Egypt. Um, worst time of day to be out shooting. Worst, uh, just not good from a uh, technical standpoint, from a shooting standpoint, just not great. So what I can do is combine these together and hopefully make my at least a, a shot that's decent enough to use. So I'll take the, uh, this time instead of two shots, I have three, I have a uh, overexposed, a medium exposure, and a, um, or actually an underexposed and a medium exposure. So I'm going to take those three and photo merge, HDR. And that will create a, create a preview, which again, looks way better than any of the individual single shots. Still not quite what I need, but it's there. Now you notice there's a little red overlay going on. That's because I have something turned on called show the ghost overlay. So if I go ahead and just simply turn that off, you might be asking, well, what did that do? Well, if you're taking three shots, uh, which is normally you have your camera set on bracketing. So bracketing will give you um, all three of those exposures. It's going to give you uh, the underexposed, overexposed, and the, the medium one, if you just do three, three brackets. So what happens if something is moving across those frames? Even if you go click, 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 even if that object was moving, chances are you caught it three in three different places because it was moving across your scene. So those horses, way back in the background, were moving. They were walking across as I went click, 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 and I was hand-holding. So if we zoom in on that, uh, without the de-ghost on, that's what I get. I get half a horse, half a horse, half a horse, half a horse. There's only supposed to be two horses. So what you can do is you can set your de-ghost to like the, just think of it as the amount of motion. If there was a little bit of motion, like a, a flag or a leaf waving, that's probably a low amount. If there was a horse stampede, that's probably a high amount. So you can play with each one till you get it the way you want, and that's showing me quickly, just by putting on medium, what the, what the scene should have looked like. In other words, it picks one frame to use. The overlay just simply shows you what was moving or what it thinks was moving at the time. All right, so if I zoom back out now and click Merge, that will create my new HDR scene from those three images. All right, and that's created my new HDR right here, and that created a new um, raw file of that scene. It also auto-toned it by default. So if I go into Develop, it's already been auto-toned, but that doesn't mean that I can't do more to it. So for example, um, with the HDR, I just want to check one thing here. Yep, with the HDR, uh, and this gets into the next thing. So first thing was create an HDR. We did that. Second thing is now, um, next, how do I do that? How do I only adjust part of an image? In other words, I can go in now and I can say dehaze. But if I dehaze to bring in the sky, which looks great now, look at what it does to the foreground. So that, that would, if, if I could only drag that one slider, I'd have to pull all the way back to where it's not screwing up the foreground. So that kind of like defeats the purpose. However, you have three ways of doing selective adjustments. You have the uh, grad gradient or graduated filter, depending on which version of Lightroom you're in. You have the radial or, um, I think it's just the radial gradient or radial filter, depending on which version of Lightroom you're in. Here in Classic, it's radial filter. And then you have the adjustment brush. So if I go ahead and grab the graduated filter or gradient filter and pull down from, oh, before I pull down, there are presets right here up in the pop-up menu. So I can preset to dehaze. Once I preset to dehaze, that means all that simply does is it turns off everything else and just moves dehaze a little bit. So that's all the presets do. If you do exposure, it moves the exposure over and turns off everything else. 
So it's just a quick way to zero everything out except the one thing you want. So now if I pull down to let's say here, I can adjust the dehaze to get the sky that I want, to get the sky that was already there without it adversely affecting the foreground. Now you might be saying, well, Terry, isn't it still affecting since you pulled it down so far? Isn't it still affecting the top of the pyramid or the front of the image? And you're right, it is. So you'll notice what you can do is you can go down to the bottom here and you can, you can go there. Oh, there we're sorry, not the bottom. You can go to the top. I always get confused with different versions of Lightroom. You go to the top and click brush. And what brush allows you to do is it allows you to brush on or off that effect on other parts of the image. So for example, if I don't want it on the front of the image, I can uh, hold down my Option or Alt key to get a negative brush and remove it. There we go. I'm removing it from that part of the image so that it's not affecting that part. And I would zoom in and do a, a more careful job with the brushing, but you get the idea. So if you're trying to do something like a gradient and it's saying, I'm going to affect this other part of the image that you, that you may care about, then just simply unbrush that part. Now along those same lines, I can switch to the, um, to the radio filter and I could say, I would really love to put a spotlight on the face. I would really love to just use a, a strobe that's like a million power and just <laughs> light up the whole, the whole front of this. Well, of course, I don't have a strobe. I didn't have a And, oh, before I do that, undo, undo. Switch it from dehaze to exposure. Now pull it out because now it will be affecting exposure, not dehaze. Now, the exposure may be too much, and it is. But it's cool because it's interactive. You can move it around, get it exactly where you want, and pull back on the amount of exposure to be just enough. And you got the same thing. So if you overspill into the other parts of the image, you can always go in and brush away those parts that you didn't want it to affect. So I'm going to brush away the edges um, that it should not, that spotlight should not be affecting. Exposure slider. Doesn't mean you can't also say, well, while I'm here, I'd love to work with a little dehaze. While I'm here, I'd love to work with a little um, saturation. Any one of these local adjustments. So if I go back to my graduated filter, or gra gra yeah, graduated filter, <laughs> and I click on the dot for that graduated filter, well, I did dehaze, but there's nothing for each one. All right, so that gives me, um, that gives me this, look better. All right, hold on. The connection again. Not sure what's going on today. I normally don't have any of these problems, but you know, that is the internet. All right. Buffering has returned. Sam, thanks for letting me know um, with the internet today. So sorry about this. Let me try to reset it here. All right. Um, again, sorry about the connection. I'm, do I'm doing the best I can. It's just a random thing happening today and doesn't normally happen. All right. We're going to move on to the next thing just to keep the, uh, hopefully the replay will be better than the live. Uh, let's keep going. So we did HDR. We, only, we did adjust only part of the image. Now let's get into cropping to a specific size. Um, let's go here to this one. So for example, wrong image. For example, if I go to this image, you'll notice that, um, I did a moon shot recently and, uh, normally, you know, I have a, yeah, I just have a, got a brand new 600 millimeter lens, but even then, even with that lens, that 600 millimeter, that's as close as I could get from my backyard to the moon because I would need probably, I don't know, <laughs> 1200, mil or 1200 millimeter to get twice as close. So this is what I got, which looks amazing. I got craters, I got everything. This lens is super sharp, but because it's so far away, that would be the normal look to it. So let's say I wanted to, um, 
I wanted to crop into that. So you'll notice the resolution, 85, uh, 8256 by 5504, that means that the, this around, if you multiply those two, it's probably gonna be around 40 something megapixel. I shot this with my D850, which I did it on purpose because that's the highest megapixel camera I have. Because the higher, this is one of those times where I usually don't care about megapixels, but this is one of those times where megapixels counts. Because the higher the megapixels, the more, more flexibility you have to crop and still have enough resolution for a decent print. So if I were going to print this out, then I might want to crop it to a print size since i got to crop it anyway. And to do that, I'm just going to go into crop. And I'm going to uh, set the, the constraint to, let's say I'm going to make it a 4x5 or 8x10. Let's say an 8x10. And then that, what that will do is that you see the rectangle moved in to crop it to that aspect ratio. But that doesn't mean you're still, you can still drag the handles in and what it will do is constrain it to be only uh, that, that aspect ratio. So I can keep cropping in, I can move the image around in the crop, I can put it right at one of the, um, one of the intersections for my rule of thirds. And I can kind of, I like it, I don't know, for some reason I like it in the upper left corner. And you can still see my resolution over there is not horribly bad. So it's still enough to make a decent print. So as you do this, you can see what your resolution is going to be as each time you let go until you get it to the resolution that whatever your minimum would be for print. So if you multiply that out, I don't know, what is that? Five, uh, three times, that's maybe a six or seven or eight megapixel image. And again, that would be more than enough. I print, used to print back in the days with four megapixels. So that's more than enough for a, certainly for an eight by 10 print and probably even larger. All right, and that will give me my much closer looking shot. Again, it's not gonna change the quality of the image. All you're saying is crop away the excess sky and that will give me more of an image. Now, if you're doing it for online, then you can even get closer because you know the maximum resolution, for example, that Instagram wants is 1080. So I'm still higher than 1080 but I can make an image that looks a lot bigger, like I got a lot closer to the moon than I really did because I had enough megapixels to crop in and still have enough resolution to share it online. All right, so that's uh, a quick cropping tip. Now, uh, along those same lines, what if I wanted both? I wanted that Instagram shot and I also wanted the print. Then what you could do is create a virtual copy. So we can go up to our, um, up to our photo menu, create virtual copy. That will create a copy right next to it that doesn't take up any space. It's only a copy in your Lightroom catalog and it's just a reference to that one. So what I would do is then on the virtual copy, go back to crop and that's the one where I might um, just bump up the resolution a little bit more so that I have still I'm cropped in, but I have a more resolution for print and that way I'll have both versions I'll have the one for, for social media and the one for print that gives me a little bit higher resolution. All right, so that's cropping to a specific size. Um, we did that one already. Now, this is, a, this is just a kind of a, a trick that um, Scott has in his book, and I love this trick. So this is one technique I did, I did copy from Scott, and that is um, <laughs> picking the right image. Click on it first. There we go. That is, you notice how this is wet like this, this is literally wet. Like there's water on this uh, sign here and um, I was in Poland when I took this. But the, the stones are not wet. Like they're, they're pretty dry, this part is. Well, if I wanted the stones or the street or the bricks or the whatever in the road to look wet, then what you could do is you could use a technique with the adjustment brush to, to fake it. So let's go into the adjustment brush. And let's go ahead and set that to two things. I just have to look at my note because I, oh, I want to make sure I get them right. You want to set your contrast. So we're going to basically put the exposure back down to zero. We're going to set our contrast up to 100. And we're going to set our clarity up to 100. So just putting those two numbers up to 100 with the adjustment brush will let you paint water onto your street. 
like so. See how it's making the, especially the edges of that look wet, even though it's not. And of course, we're doing it in Lightroom, so it's all non-destructive. All right, so that's that's just a quick how to make the street look wet tip. But here's a bonus one. What if it doesn't look wet enough? So you did, you did 100 on both. You can't make it 110. You can't make it 150. You can't make it more. That's all you get. So if that doesn't look wet enough, well, do it again. <laughs> what do you mean, Terry? It's already at 100. How can I do it again? You can click New or the plus sign in Lightroom to create a new brush. So if I click New, now I'm brushing again with a second brush stroke. And I can make it look wetter. Or maybe it's too much. At, now this will be effectively 200%. And then I could tone this one down if it were too much, but actually it looks pretty good. So you can do that as many times as you need to, to get it to look as wet as you want it to. So, and you might say, well, how do I know which one I'm adjusting? See that little circle there? That's the one I'm adjusting now. And if I were to click out of it and go back in, I'll see two circles. I'll see the first one where I first put my brush stroke and then I'll see the second one to the left of it where I put my second brush stroke. So if I needed to adjust either one, I'd find the one that I need to adjust. I hover over it. First of all, that will show me if I missed anything. And then I did. So I can go ahead and get those spots I missed. There we go. So if I hover over it again, it will show me. Oh, still miss some spots over here and over here. Hover over it. Don't click. Just hover. And it'll show you any area you might have missed with your brush strokes or any area you got too much of. So if I got too much, I went over the edge, I can hold down the Option or Alt key and erase that along the edge where I went over. And I still missed that one little spot up there. All right, you get the idea. And also, because I'm on that adjustment, I can turn that one down. If it, if it was too wet, I can turn that one down and adjust it to whatever I need it to be. Uh, if I felt that you know, like 200 to too much, maybe 170% would be better. All right, Fury says that's a really great tip. Good, cool. I'm glad you like it. Uh, I'll give the one tip, that one tip, full credit to Scott Kelby. He taught me that in his book. I actually taught me that before the book, <laughs> but that was one that I definitely got from the book to show you. All right. Um, we did that one. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. And that's uh, one that I got. I did a conference earlier this week and I kept getting this question. Uh, or I got this question after the conference. So let's go back out. Hold on one second here. I keep doing that. All right, let's go out. And let's, um, let's work with this landscape. Now, what I, was, what I was telling the class, and I'm going to reset it. What I was telling the class is that I do cert a certain few things to every single photo I do. Like uh, every single photo I bring in the Lightroom, I usually do two or three things no matter what it is. So one of those things is if I shot it with my, if I didn't shoot it with mirrorless, let's put it that way. Then I go to lens corrections and I enable the lens profile correction. That will automatically seek out what camera and what lens you shot it with. Great. It, you definitely want it on. If you don't need it, it won't hurt anything to turn it on. Like you won't see any difference. So why not just turn it on every time? What chromatic aberration halo around your subject? Just check, checking that box looks for it and removes it. But if you don't have that green halo, checking that box does nothing. So you, you check it all the time. You will never have to worry about it. So I do that. I also go into my um, back to my basic panel and I apply a profile. So like, for example, if I was bringing in landscape shots, chances are I wanna start with the landscape profile. All right, cool. Now, if I'm, if I'm let's take it one step further. Let's say I, I sh I've shot a bunch of sh shots outside in daylight. That's not the right one. Let's do cloudy. That's not the right one. We're gonna leave this one alone. <laughs> but let's say you, know, you were doing those on like all your daylight shots or all your cloudy shots, whatever it is. So the two or three things I always do, I might as well not have to do those manually every single time. So what you can do is on the left-hand side, you notice there's, a, on, while you're in the develop module, there's presets. And there's all kinds of presets that ship with Lightroom. 
but you can make your own. You can click your plus sign and say, hey, I want this to be the preset that I always use for importing landscapes. So I can create a preset. I can call it um, importing landscapes. I want apply. Now you can say check all because that's all you did were those two things. Or you can be very specific and check just the things you just did. So I can check lens correction because I did that. And I can check um, profile. Profile. Where's my profile? It's not the profile profile. Unless profiles can't be applied. Oh, there it is. Treatment and profile. There it is. All right. So if I do those two things and save it as a preset, now when I do an import, when I do an import and let go on the right one, there we go. Not export, import. All right. When I do an import, I can tell it which develop setting to use. So I can go down to my um, to my user presets and I can choose import landscapes. So now when I bring photos in with that, it will automatically apply them to all the photos I bring in. So that way that's two or three or four things I don't have to do now to those new photos I imported because it's already done to them. And selecting multiple images and then going to your develop module, make sure auto sync is turned on in the bottom right hand corner. We did this the first time we did what uh, the, this class part one. And then just going and choosing that preset. So if I go to um, import landscapes, click. Now that preset's been applied to those three images or those 30 images or those 300 images or those 3,000 images. So um, even if you didn't do it on, upon import, you forgot or you didn't have the preset created. Hang on a minute. Let me make sure that I see someone said. Let me check the connection one more time. We were good for a while. Okay, hopefully we are back. I just reset the uh, stream again. Hopefully we're back. using it. I'm going to one in the target collection. We we'll use that example. Oh, wait, 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 I saw it. Hang on. I saw one. There we go. And this one. Okay, I just added two more images to my target collection. And let's go back to that collection again. How do I do that in Lightroom? Here are the two images. Next up is, this is the type of image you usually get when you're photographing up at buildings whether it's a skyline or whether it's downtown or, or just buildings in general. Notice how the buildings are starting to like just feel like they're leaning in on each other and you know those buildings are not leaning. It's just what your lens is doing to distort them. That to look right. Um, well, we can do, hang on. Hold on real, right, real quick. I just, I see a buffering thing again. What a day for streaming. Okay, anyway, um, how do I get Lightroom to fix that leaning problem for me? Well, um, geometry area in Lightroom Classic, it's called Transform in Lightroom and Lightroom on your phone, it's called Geometry. And there's an upright section. So what I can do is I can go in and I can choose Auto and auto did it looks like it's leaning in a little to the right barely like I, I would so with guided you need two circle guide it doesn't matter but you need at least two so i'm going to drag my first guide out to what should be straight so I'm, um the next guy we're going to drag on this building that wasn't quite straight enough and we'll drag that guide out and then that will make those two areas perfectly straight up and down now you can see that that created some white space on the lower left and right hand side so you can either deal with that one of two ways you can always go in and crop it 
do that. So maybe you, you, you know, depending on the image, you might want to do a content or a fill as well. But that will uh, allow you to straighten your images uh, to get them perfectly straight based on what you chose uh, for your guides. All right, next up, same thing here, develop module. We'll do an auto upright until the white space has been cured. But that's what auto upright will do, or you can always do guided upright um, so that we can manually choose where we want to fix the uh, leaning part. All right, uh, next up is how do I fix an image that needs more than what Lightroom does? Lightroom just doesn't have the tools or capabilities of handling this one thing. So in other words, how do I go from Lightroom to Photoshop and back? That is called round tripping. And you can, of course, do that. I'm just looking for an image that I want to do it with. That's why I'm just like scrolling up and down while I talk. Uh, let's find an image here. All right, let's do this one. So I've, I've got this image here and <laughs> got this image here. There we go. Um, and I, I want to remove this light and stand. The light illuminated my subject, but now I don't need the light in the final image. So to do that, I'm going to uh, just quickly, uh, you can right click on it or you can use a keyboard shortcut, edit in Photoshop. If it's a raw file, that'll take a copy over to Photoshop. If it's a JPEG or TIFF or anything else, it'll ask you what you want to take over to Photoshop. Here it is. And now that it's here, I can um, make a quick selection of it. So I can actually oh, try the new object selection tool. I haven't tried that on this image. All right, not bad. It missed part of the leg. So I can hold on my shift key and see if I can add that back in. There we go. We got the leg. We got to select it, but it selected it very tightly. In other words, it likes and expand it. And I don't know. I expand it by like 10 pixels. Not enough. Let's do more resolution. There we go. 20 pixels. And that expanded it out so I can see um, a little bit of everything around that selection. Great. So, okay. And let content aware fill fill that back in. Once it does, save it, content overfill. All right, folks, I am out of time. And unfortunately, we had lots of issues with streaming and internet and all that today. Best I could. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody.